Welcome back to Plant-Based Kidney Health. My name is Michelle Krosmer and I am a renal dietitian and I am joined by nephrologist, Dr. Sean Hashmi. How are you doing today, Dr. Hashmi? Oh, I'm doing well. I can't believe it's January. It's still cold outside, but you know what? We had a great holiday season and we're all still healthy, so we're doing great. Good, good. Me too. We're in 2022 now and recording more episodes. We're on episode seven and Today's topic is actually going to be broken into two or three episodes because it is so in-depth. We get so many questions about this, and we really just want to make sure that we can hopefully break things down for you guys, explain things in a way that makes sense. So, you know, our topic today, it's hypertension and kidney disease or high blood pressure and kidney disease. And I really think the best place to start then is the first question um, is kind of the basics of just what is the link between hypertension and the kidneys? Yeah, so Michelle, this is a great question. And by the way, for everybody who's watching, you know, these questions that we're picking are the ones you guys ask. So please don't forget, we always remind you at the end as well, plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. That's our email. Email us with any questions you have. If you put them in the comments, we'll take those questions as well. And of course, we'd appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe button, leave us a review on it. That's what helps us to continue this work. So for the first question, Michelle, you wanted to know, you know, what's the link between high blood pressure and kidney disease? Well, this is a really, really important and complex topic. First, as you know, in our previous episodes, we've talked about the number one cause of kidney disease, which is diabetes. But guess what number two is? It's high blood pressure. So kidney disease has three big things, which is diabetes, high blood pressure, and put it all together is obesity. But what's really interesting and scary is in terms of high blood pressure, it's present in about 80 to 85% of the people who have chronic kidney disease. So this is such an important topic to understand what's going on. Now, what's really interesting is, is when we talk about, now there's a couple of scientific words for those people watching this, so let me explain those. When we say incidence, that's the new occurrence of something. And when we say prevalence, that's another way of saying how many people have it. So. When you look at the MDRD study, and remember, that's my running joke because, you know, I'm an MD, Michelle's an RD, so we're MDRD. But the MDRD study, which is the Modification of Diet and Renal Disease Study, was a landmark study that looked at a lot of basic questions. One of them was high blood pressure. And what it showed was that when it comes to prevalence, which means how many people have high blood pressure, as they looked at people's prevalence of high blood pressure, the prevalence increased from 65% to 95% as people's kidney functions drop from 85 down to 15. So in other words, as your kidneys get worse, the odds of you having high blood pressure go high. So high, in fact, that it's up to 95% of the people have it. And this is why knowing how to treat it is so important. Now, high blood pressure is not an equal opportunity employer. In other words, it's biased. So if you have extra weight and if you're of a certain ethnic group, so in this particular case, it's African-Americans. Also, what we talked about in the past was African-Americans are four times more likely to have high blood pressure going on. So African-Americans and extra weight puts you already at risk. The lower your GFR, the more likely you are to have it. And when it comes to the real link between high blood pressure and CKD, what happens is it's like a chicken or the egg, and we'll talk about that in a little detail, but really what happens is high blood pressure can lead to chronic kidney disease, but chronic kidney disease can lead to high blood pressure, and the mechanism is is that you get all of this salt being stuck inside the body. You have activation of the system called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the RAS system is really really important you know the the idea behind RAS if you think about it physiologically was that if you were bleeding somewhere the body would sacrifice the kidneys and everything else to save the heart and the brain so one of the things that you see with the RAS system is is it takes your blood vessels and it constricts them so it decreases the blood flow to the kidneys. It's trying to preserve the heart and the brain. That's a good way of looking at it. But the RAS system, if you do it in normal people and you reduce the blood flow to the kidney, you're damaging it. 
then high blood pressure is how much pressure is being applied against the vessels of your um, blood arteries and veins and so forth. The more pressure you apply against them, it leads to remodeling and stiffening. So you get all of the stiffening going on. And then the last thing that happens is, is your sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight, that's how active it is. It starts to run hyper all the time. Put all of those things together. And that's why high blood pressure and chronic kidney disease are a setup for things like heart attacks, strokes, and all sorts of bad things in the future. That's a really good, really good explanation for that. And so what is a normal or ideal blood pressure range then and what counts as elevated or high blood pressure? That's a great question. So as we think about what is considered normal, the things is, is that details around that have really changed from how we used to think about it in the past. So back in the day, you know, we used to say things like, well, if your blood pressure is over 140 on uh, the top number, which you call systolic blood pressure, and if it's over 90 on the bottom number, that's considered to be high. That's not the case anymore. The latest guidelines, and we're going to get into this question more in the detail, but the latest guidelines are really that if you're over 120 on the top number and over 80 on the bottom number, that's considered high. Now, there's degrees and stages, but you're already in the high category if you are over 120 over 80 going on. Yep, that's helpful. And maybe something, too, that you can explain. I think what comes up a lot and that a lot of people experience is that white coat syndrome or, you know, they go to the doctor, they're nervous, their blood pressure is elevated, but maybe they check at home and it's always normal. Um, is that something, I guess, can someone, what should they do in that situation if they always go to their doctor and it's higher than it is when it is at home, when they check? Yeah. So, you know, when I was in training and, you know, I'm only 20, so I was in training yesterday. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I turned 47 last year and I'm, I'm quickly approaching the big five oh. But when I was in training, this concept of white coat hypertension was the idea that you would get nervous. And so you went to the doctor's office and your blood pressure was high. And therefore, we never looked at it. We never thought about it. We ignored it. And there's still a lot of physicians who still ignore white coat hypertension. But the data shows that white coat is actually a sign of things to happen in the future. It's a sign that says what? Your sympathetic drive is in overdrive. So in other words, your sympathetic nervous system runs very high and you need to really start focusing on that. How? You don't necessarily need medications if your blood pressure is running normal at home, but you need everything that Michelle and I talk about, which is the lifestyle, which is the meditation, which is the sleep, which is the exercise, which is the stress, right? And then, of course, which is the food. And if you focus on those things, you can help to calm down the drive somewhat. And that's important to understand. So unlike before, you still have to pay attention nowadays to white coat. Then there's what's called dippers and non-dippers. And so there's actually four types of high blood, I'm sorry, four types of blood pressure you need to understand. Dippers are people whose blood pressure dips in the evening. So Michelle, if I took your blood pressure in the morning and then I repeated it in the evening, I would expect your evening blood pressure to be lower than your morning blood pressure. But non-dippers are people whose blood pressure is either the same or higher in the evening. And it turns out that their risk for things like heart attack or stroke is higher. So when we have our patients check their blood pressure, the reason why I ask them, give me a morning and an evening. One is because I need to dose appropriately. Do they take their meds in the morning? evening and so forth. Two is, I'm also trying to do risk factor stratification to understand, are they dippers or not? You're supposed to dip in your blood pressure as the day goes on. So that's normal. Non-dippers is a higher risk. Gotcha. Interesting. And I think that's just a really important thing to um, emphasize is that if you're if you have high blood pressure, if you're recommended to check your blood pressure at home, please check your blood pressure at home. Make sure you have a machine and cuff that work um, because it's so much easier for your doctor to dose your medication and provide recommendation if they know what it is at least once a day, but ideally twice a day versus if, 
they're just going off one point in time when you come into the doctor, that's not really representative of what it is on a daily basis. And then um, the other thing that I think is really important to mention with this is just, again, knowledge is power and awareness around this. And I've heard way too many times that people said they had no idea they had high blood pressure because they don't go to a, a regular um, uh, PCP or they don't do annual exams or things like that. So they hadn't had their blood pressure checked in five, 10 years. And then all of a sudden it's been high, it's been damaging the kidney. So it's just something for everyone to, whether you have kidney disease or not, if you um, have any, you know, friends, family, loved ones that maybe are putting off just regular physical exams or putting off, uh, you know, blood pressure is just white coat syndrome. It might be important to check that at home and really see what it is on a daily basis. Yeah, you said something that's really, really important, which is no symptoms. So remember, guys, you know, we've talked about this in all of our episodes. One in seven have kidney disease. 90 plus percent of the patients who have kidney disease don't know they have kidney disease because there are no symptoms. High blood pressure in the majority of people, there are no symptoms. If you're waiting till you have the headaches, then that's where the blood pressure is like 200 and something, and it's really critical. But people walking around with blood pressures in the 150s, 160s, 170s, it's really high, and it's really bad, and it's stiffening your blood vessels, and you need to know about it. So if you haven't checked your blood pressure, please, every single store out there, they have a cuff that you can use for free. But now, the, the days, the cuffs are about 20 bucks. You don't need any of the bells and whistles. A basic blood pressure cuff, Check it, put it on your arm, put your arm at heart level, rest it somewhere, don't hold it, but rest it on something, and then just check your blood pressure. Remember, you want to have your back against a chair, you don't want your legs crossed, and you want to make sure you pee before you check your blood pressure, because if your bladder is full, it will raise your blood pressure. If your legs are crossed, this is a good one for women, because women will cross their legs when they're getting their blood pressure checked and it comes up higher. Uncross the legs. Sit relaxed, hand, heart level, and get your blood pressure checked. And if it's elevated, it's not the end of the world. That's where Michelle and I are trying to help you guys with that. Yeah, that's helpful. I didn't know about, I knew about the crossing your legs, but I didn't realize about if you have a full bladder, that can impact your blood pressure too. Interesting. Yeah. All right, Michelle, we had another question, and that was, you know, when it comes to blood pressure, let's talk a little bit about diet and lifestyle. Does it make a difference? Does it impact how your blood pressure is? Yes. Yes, of course it does. Um, we, of course, will dive more into the food and specifics with food, but thinking of just other lifestyle factors. So you had mentioned stress before. So um, stress management is very important for controlling blood pressure levels. Physical activity is also important. So if someone is physically inactive or they're very sedentary, that can um, impact and raise your blood pressure levels. Um you know, other things like smoking always come up. Um, alcohol intake is important. And then even excess body fat can also um, contribute to elevated blood pressure levels. So I'd say those are all things on the side of lifestyle. And of course, diet is a lifestyle as well. But then from the food side of it, we are looking, you know, you mentioned salt and sodium is a huge part of that, um, as well as when we think of excess body fat and obesity, you know, potentially excess calories, the type of, you know, if it's a highly a standard American diet of, you know, highly processed, refined foods. And then um, the other thing that comes up, it's not as directly related to blood pressure, but kind of overall cardiovascular health is fiber intake. And most Americans are not getting enough fiber in the diet. And so all of those things, I mean, we can dive more into details with those, but all of those things are very important. And, um, you know, we're going to go a lot more into the sodium, but you, people are always asking, well, how much sodium should I have in a day? And one of the important things to recognize is that most, and I always say most Americans, cause I'm not positive other, you know, I'm sure other, um, countries potentially have similar issues, but at least in the United States, most people are consuming, you know, 34, 3,600 milligrams of sodium per day or more. And what is generally considered or recommend recommended is, you know, 2,300 milligrams or less, but we really want to go even, um, usually want to go even tighter with that for kidney and heart health and recommend up to 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. And that does not mean that you have to eat, right? If you've consumed 
1200 milligrams for the day that you need to now add in the salty snack to get to that 1500 milligrams, but it's typically up to that 1500 milligrams of sodium mark for the day. And, um, when we think of, you know, the majority of salt, you know, so if someone's saying, oh, well, I don't put salt on my food, so I don't consume too much sodium, you know, 70, 75% of the salt that we actually consume usually comes from processed food, packaged food, fast food, restaurant food. And if you've ever looked up online, the nutrition information for a restaurant or a fast food restaurant, it truly is shocking. Like if we're trying to limit to about 1500 milligrams a day of sodium, one dish at a one meal at a fast food restaurant can be that or even twice that amount. And so that's something to really keep in mind as well as, you know, what types of sauces and dressings and condiments and even canned products like canned soups are oftentimes very, very high in sodium. So it could be, you know, it will come down to reading the labels because it's, it's shocking how much salt is really added to processed packaged food and then restaurant and fast food meals. Yeah, that's that's amazing and scary all at the same time. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing around that, too, oh, and we will dive into this more. But I what I often get asked, too, is, well, how do I make sure I'm getting enough sodium? And, and we've said this before, is if you simply track your intake for a couple of days, you can really see how much salt you're getting in your diet. And you'll see how I think most people are shocked how quickly sodium can add up unless you're literally cooking absolutely everything from scratch and you're not adding any salt to your fully home cooked meals. Um, but even in that case, you know, on that lower end, you know, potentially around 500 milligrams, maybe even a little less. Um, that's where we're looking at on the lower end of sodium and what you would want to take in, which is really, really, really easy to get. Um, most people are not consuming too little sodium. Most people are consuming way too much sodium in their diet. I think that's a really important point. And I know we have a question about sodium coming up, but, you know, I don't think a lot of people have to worry about getting too little salt, period. Yeah. And that, okay, so that does lead into, um, I guess, a couple, a two part question. But, and this is something that I get asked all the time and is if someone does not have high blood pressure, do they need to limit the salt in their diet? Yes. <laughs> and here's why, right? So if you thought about this logically, you would come back and argue and say, look, I'm doing fine. Why can I not worry about anything? Because this is why. First is, is what, uh, Michelle, you really alluded to, which is, you know, how much salt we actually consume. So when it comes to sodium intake and we, you know, talk about a number like 3,600 milligrams that's an average number where there, that, what that average means is you're taking all those numbers and trying to find a point in the middle. That means half the people consume more than that. In fact, it's not uncommon for the typical, the SAD or the standard American diet to be consuming 5,000 milligrams or more. So what the data shows is that 50% of the people consume more sodium than they're supposed to. What's the issue with sodium? It's causing water to be retained inside the body. Now your kidneys work extra hard to try to get rid of that. Remember, as it's trying to do that and hold on to water, it's also creating more pressure against those blood vessels. As it does that, it creates stiffness. So what that means is over years and years, that will lead to stiffer blood vessels. As the blood vessels get stiffer, that's where we start to run into issues of having things like high blood pressures, having things like pulse pressure, which is the difference between the top and the bottom number. And some people in some studies, it shows that that number is important in others. It shows that, you know what, pulse pressure doesn't really matter. You don't need to pay attention to it. Just pay attention to the overall blood pressure number. But regardless, you want to focus on trying to eat less processed foods, more whole foods, and focus on the sodium content because no matter what you think you eat, Every time you go out to eat, you're consuming way more sodium than what Michelle and I are trying to ask you guys to do. Yeah. So that effect of, you know, that fluid retention and is, is that happening with a high sodium diet regardless if someone is having fluid, like seeing swelling or edema in, let's say, their ankles or their feet? Like they might have absolutely no signs or symptoms mm -hmm. of that, but on the inside, excess sodium intake, there's more fluid retention kind of on the inside, and then the kidneys are having to work harder. 
Yeah. So, you know, when we have patients who've been on dialysis for a while and, you know, they look great, you know, they don't have swelling in their legs going on and we put a brand new kidney into them. The first thing that happens over the first 24 to 48 hours, they pee out like crazy. And, you know, when I was a fellow in training, I remember it used to always surprise me. I would say, where the heck is this water coming from? It's not in their ankles. It's not visible to us. But this is what you got to remember is, is there's things that are visible and then there's things that are invisible to us. Just because that we don't see them doesn't mean that they still can't hurt us. So that's where... The fluid retention is just there and your kidneys are working so well to balance out the extra fluid, but you're just adding more pressure where you don't need to. You don't need to make your kidneys work harder than they need to, and you don't need to make extra pressure on your blood vessels if they don't need it. Yep. So another question with this that that came up and comes up often then is how do our blood sodium levels um, relate to the sodium that we eat in our diet and if someone has low blood sodium levels does that mean then that they need to eat more salt yeah so a very very complex issue so when we talk about low sodium inside the blood we're talking about a medical term called hyponatremia now hyponatremia comes in a lot of different varieties that you want to know about the first thing you got to know is we classify low sodium into mild moderate and severe on the severe side you need to really really be careful because it can cause seizures coma and death so normal sodium inside your blood is about 135 milliequivalents per liter to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Now, low sodium is classified in those three categories. So mild is about 130 to about 134. Moderate, I think of it as about 120 to 129, but severe is less than 120. So now you have the definition of hypo or low, natremia or salt. Now comes the next question of deciding how do you treat it, right? Now there's two big things you have to know. Is it acute or is it chronic? Because the treatment is different. If it's chronic, you have to be very, very concerned about raising the salt level too fast because if you restore their salt level too fast, you will permanently damage their brain. It is a very serious irreversible condition. So you got to know, is it acute? The definition is less than 48 hours, meaning you just had surgery and your salt level dropped. If it's acute, nine out of 10 times, it will correct by itself. My job is to monitor it, stay out of the way and only intervene if it's needed. If it's chronic, meaning more than 48 hours, I usually have to get involved. Now, when I have to get involved, what I need to know is what's going on. You see, Low salt is usually not because of low salt intake. So one more time, the blood salt level is usually not low because you're not consuming enough salt. It's usually low because your body's holding on to too much water. So remember, imagine if I have, I'm holding up my left hand, so I have five pieces of salt in my cup of coffee here. So I have a concentration of, let's say, five in 100 cc's. But if I change this coffee cup into a gigantic cup that's 1,000 cc's, my concentration has drastically gone down. But did I change my five pieces of salt? Absolutely not. So concentration matters. So if I get somebody who has a lot of water, meaning I look at them, they're swollen everywhere, we call that hypervolemic, meaning hyper meaning high, volemic hyponatremic, so they're high sodium uh, level going, I'm sorry, they're high volume, hypervolemic, high volume, and low salt. The treatment is I need to get rid of the water from them, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to change the concentration and bring it back. Then there's the opposite spectrum, which is hypovolemic, hyponatremia. That means my volume is very down. I've been throwing up like crazy and all sorts of other things have been happening. The treatment is, is you just have to give those people a little bit of volume and it will fix the salt because the kidneys will take care of it. The ones that are the hardest to treat are what we call euvolemic. They're like you and I. Their salt level is okay. I'm sorry, their, their volume level is okay. So their water is okay, but their salt is low. 
And the most common type of that is called SIADH, which stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. That's a mouthful. But that's why it makes me sound fancy. And even though <laughs> all I'm saying is their volume's okay and their sodium is low. Now, the treatment for that is, is we restrict their fluids. That's first and foremost. And we give them some salt taps. So the answer to that question is, is if your sodium is low, you need to make sure that you work with your doctor so we can figure out in that whole complex thing that I just went over in detail to know where do you stand and how we can fix it. Okay, got it. That's very helpful. And in that third situation then where their fluid volume is normal, but they're having the low blood sodium levels and you're restricting the fluid is that because I hear that often people will say oh well my blood sodium was low so I was told I need I'm drinking too much water um and I feel like that oftentimes comes up more in like a more elderly population and where they're told that so how is that related and is that something where they have to always consume a lower amount of fluid or is that a short-term thing until you get the blood sodium back up or will it just keep going back and forth so Low sodium or hyponatremia is a really difficult thing to control. Number two is you have to be very, very careful about restricting their uh, fluid level because you don't want to make them dehydrate. Remember, the definition of euvolemic means on the outside, I look like my fluid status is okay, but on the inside, I still have extra water. So the fluid restriction is because of what's happening on the inside. But as I do that, I have to be very careful, especially with my folks that are elderly, not to dehydrate them. So this is why when I have patients who are older, I always end up having to use salt tabs with it because of the fact that it's not realistic to restrict them down to, you know, a liter a day, 1200 cc's a day, because when I do, they're not going to do a good job of measuring and they can go into acute kidney injury or acute renal failure simply because of what I was trying to do. So this is why it's so important to work with your nephrologist on this because we do with this so much and it's like this really, really, you know, medicine is an art more than it's anything else and the art or practice of medicine is the more experience you have making small changes and seeing how the reaction is the better off we're able to deal with that we don't want to correct it too fast and we don't want to bring the volume down so much that you go the opposite direction got it that's very helpful and that's something that a lot of people asked questions on so i'm i'm excited that you were able to answer that and, you know, I think we'll, we'll have to talk about this topic because there's so much more on this low sodium issue because it is a serious condition. And by the way, both low sodium and high sodium in the blood can cause seizures, coma and death. And we need to be concerned about that. But what the salt level you take in, it's a little bit different than what's really happening to your sodium level because of the fact that salt goes in and out of cells and it goes out the kidneys. So your body has mechanisms to protect yourself. All right, Michelle, time for one last question, which is, can you provide some tips for how to flavor food or meals or so forth? You know, when, when people are trying to take our advice and follow a low sodium diet, what are some tips for them? Yes. So still add flavor to your food. Um, I think the biggest thing is we, again, saltiness is something that we kind of grow accustomed to and our taste buds become heightened for and the more we are eating out the more we're eating salty food the more we feel like we need it on our food so first i would say is if you are you know consuming the standard american diet potentially having you know double or triple the amount of sodium that you should be having and you're starting to cut back and food is just kind of tasting bland um one is no your taste buds will adjust and um you know just give it a little time and it's not it's a very short amount of time for your taste buds to adjust, but you want to um, replace that salt that you're typically adding to your food with other herbs and spices and that are just naturally salt free or lower in sodium. So some of my favorite are things like garlic and onion, um, different either spice blends or powders. So think of black pepper, cumin, chili powder, paprika, rosemary, bay leaves. There's 
I mean, unlimited amount of spices that are just naturally salt free or lower in sodium. And then there are a lot of blends. Like if you find the, you know, the, um, what is it? The seasoning salt or, um, different spice blends that are very, very salty. You can usually find a low sodium version of that online where you just you know, you combine those different herbs and spices yourself, like a barbecue rub that doesn't have the salt or just has less salt added to it. So <clears throat> I'd say those are good ways. You can also find lower sodium condiments at the grocery store. Um, and I know we're going to dive a little bit more into this as far as labels and things to, to look at in the next episode when we continue on with sodium and hypertension. But I, that would be the biggest thing is don't, it's, don't think it's salt or nothing. You still want to be adding lots of flavor with those herbs and spices and onion and garlic and shallots and um, things like cilantro. I mean, all of those are great to use and they can pack a lot of flavor. Even lemon and lime um, and vinegars can add a lot of, fl- of flavor to food. And so um, making up a quick little dressing yourself at home or putting that lemon lime vinegar with those seasonings over your food is good. And then even if someone is adding a little bit of salt to their food, then adding it like don't add it in the cooking process, add it at like right before you serve your meal, instead of adding it in the cooking process where you kind of taste it and you're like, Oh, I need more, I need more, I need more. And then you still put it on your food right before you eat. Just leave it out. If you need to add a little bit, you know, right before you consume your meal, you can, or things like hot sauce, um, where you get the vinegar and the heat and different spices as well can pack a lot of flavor without being very, very high in sodium. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love all of that. So, Michelle, I think we got to continue this for another episode because I have so many other questions that people talked about on high blood pressure. Yes. Yeah, we will continue this with um, episode eight. So stay tuned for that, you guys. Um, But again, please remember to subscribe to our channel. You can submit questions that you have to plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com and we will answer them in upcoming episodes. Perfect. And, and guys, we would really appreciate it. You know, if you listen to podcasts, we're all over there, uh, iTunes, Spotify, everywhere. We would love it if you would leave a review for us. That's how we're able to promote this work. If you haven't shared this with your friends and family, please go ahead and share this. This is how we're able to continue this work. It's really a labor of love on both Michelle and my part. We're both busy enough as it is, but we really want to do something to give back. So we would really appreciate your support on this. Yes. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.